This is going to be my fifth board review video, and in this video, I'm going to show you the question, which is going to take 10 seconds, and then I'm going to show you the answer right away. There's a total of 10 cases in this video. This is a complete whiteout of one hemithorax, and the main two things in the differential are a large pleural effusion and complete collapse of the lung. And in order to tell the difference between those two things, you have to look at the mediastinum. And in this case, the mediastinum is shifted towards the side of the abnormality. So that means this is a complete lung collapse rather than a pleural effusion or some other space occupying lesion. Okay. The other thing that we have here is an abrupt cutoff of this bronchus right here, and that's something called the bronchial cutoff sign. And so if we look at the answer choices, these top three things here are going to be things that shift the mediastinum away from the abnormality, contralateral mediastinal shift. The only thing that makes sense in this case is a mucus plug, which is the cause of the bronchial cutoff sign here and it's causing complete collapse of the left lung. In this question, I gave you two images of the chest and it shows diffuse ground glass opacity. And in a couple areas, there are some cysts that have formed. So the question says that the patient is treated with high dose steroids for multiple sclerosis, and they have a new dry cough. So what's the most likely diagnosis? So because of the steroids, this patient is immunocompromised. So in any patient who has a new cough, who's immunocompromised, the first thing that you should think about is a new pneumonia. And in this case, it's an atypical pneumonia. So C is the right answer. Now this could represent pulmonary edema or pulmonary alveolar proteinosis if I gave you a different clinical scenario. But these two answer choices don't really make sense in the setting of a new cough in an immunocompromised patient. Lipoid pneumonia isn't really the correct answer because uh, if I were to show you lipoid pneumonia in a test scenario, I would show you not only the lung windows, but the soft tissue windows showing you the fat within the consolidation. So that, that doesn't make sense here. The second part of this question asked, what is the most likely bug? And the answer to that is PJP pneumonia. PJP pneumonia is something that is classically seen in patients with HIV and they have a low CD4 count. Um, and the classic appearance on CT is a crazy paving appearance. This is not quite crazy paving. Crazy paving is diffuse ground glass opacity with interlobular septal thickening, which we don't really have that much interlobular septal thickening in this case. But uh, the patients will have bilateral symmetric airspace opacities. Usually they don't have pleural effusions. And then the pneumatoceles are what give it this name pneumocystis. In this question, I gave you three images of the lung going from the apices to the bases. And what we have here are some nodules and some masses, um, and they show cavitation centrally. Those are these little air bubbles within the, within the uh, consolidation. Um, and the other thing is that they seem to be peripherally located, like this one is at the lung periphery, that, that one is at the lung periphery, this one's in the lung periphery. This one's not quite, um, but um, most of them are at the lung periphery. So the most likely diagnosis in this case is septic emboli. The other ones don't really show cavitation. So pulmonary lymphoma, the classic example of that, are going to be nodules and masses with air bronchograms in them, not really cavitation. Organizing pneumonia doesn't cavitate. And then NTM, you can see nodules with M NTM, but they're not going to be this big. And usually the distribution, at least 
that classically is middle lobe and lingular predominant. So that's why D is the correct answer. Which bug is most likely? So the most likely bug for septic emboli is Staph aureus. So the classic appearance of septic emboli on CT will be peripheral consolidation and cavities. In the question stem, they might give you a history of recent dental procedure or IV drug use. So if you see that in the history, that should clue you in to the diagnosis of septic emboli. Thirty-five-year-old, what is the most likely diagnosis? So in this top image here, I'm showing you that there's an area of lung, specifically the left upper lobe, that is completely hyperlucent to the rest of the lung. And then on the second image, there is this nodule with a central calcification, and it looks like it's in the left upper lobe bronchus. And I'm just showing you that again on the coronal images here. So let's look at the answer choices. What is the most likely diagnosis? So squamous cell carcinoma is not something that's common in a 35-year-old. That's going to be an older patient where you see that. Carcinoid is the correct answer here. We have an endobronchial lesion with calcification, and it's causing air trapping. ABPA, you can have air trapping with ABPA, but it's not going to present as a nodule. It's going to present more as bronchiectasis with mucus plugging, and typically the mucus plugging has high attenuation. Bronchiolitis obliterans doesn't really present as a mass, but you can see um, air trapping with it, uh, but you just won't have the central mass. This question says, what is the most likely pattern? So I have two images at baseline and two images one year later. This image over here is a little bit higher up, and this image over here is a little bit lower down. So what we have is ground glass opacity and reticulation at the peripheral lung bases, and it seems to be a little bit more at the bases compared with this other image, which is a little bit higher up. So let's go through the answer choices here. What is the most likely pattern? So it's not UIP, and the reason it's not UIP is it's too much um, ground glass opacity to call this UIP. This could be NSIP, so I'm going to hold that for now. It's not chronic HP because it's a lower low predominant process. Also, I'm not really giving you expiratory images, and if you were to see this on a test, chronic HP, you should see expiratory images because it'll show air trapping. And it's not organizing pneumonia because organizing pneumonia is typically going to be a little bit more patchy rather than confluent like this. And then it should change a little bit more over time with some areas getting better and some areas getting worse. So really the correct answer here is NSIP. The next question is about NSIP and it's, it says which shows spatial and temporal homogeneity and the correct answer is NSIP. And then what is the most likely diagnosis of the left lower lobe opacity? So we have something that got worse from baseline to one year later. Organizing pneumonia is probably not the right answer because we would expect some of it to get worse, some of it to get better, not just one focal area to get worse. And um, infection is not likely because we have too long of a time frame for infection one year. Focal fibrosis, um, it doesn't really look like focal fibrosis. You know, it looks more like dense consolidation. So the correct answer here is lung cancer. There's a lot of different ways that NSIP differs from UIP, but these are some important ones that you're likely to be tested on. NSIP has something called spatial and temporal homogeneity, meaning if you sample two different parts of the lung, they're going to show about the same degree or severity of fibrosis and inflammation. Um, and that's true on the radiology as well as the pathology. Whereas in UIP, it shows spatial and temporal heterogeneity, 
meaning that two different areas of lung will have different degrees of fibrosis. In NSIP, it tends to have more ground glass opacity compared to UIP. NSIP is usually associated with identifiable causes, whereas UIP, it's usually idiopathic, meaning it's usually from IPF. And then the classic appearance of NSIP will have subpleural sparing, meaning the last two or three millimeters of lung by the pleura is going to be spared of fibrosis. It's going to be relatively clear. And UIP, the classic appearance, will be honeycombing. So this left lower lobe opacity was a chronic airspace opacity. And I have another video going over the differential for a chronic airspace opacity. But the mnemonic that I came up with is space V. So sarcoid, uh, different types of pneumonia, atelectasis, cancer, eosinophilic pneumonia, and vasculitis. So the fact that this is a progressive consolidation suggests that uh, this is cancer. Here I have soft tissue windows and lung windows of a nodule in the right middle lobe, and it has coarse popcorn-like calcification centrally, so the most likely diagnosis in this case is a hamartoma. You should know the different types of calcifications that can form in a lung nodule. In this case, the presence of popcorn-like calcification goes along with hamartoma. The other thing that you might see in a patient with a hamartoma is fat within the nodule, although you don't have to see the fat to, for it to be a hamartoma. In this case, I have two lesions, one in the right upper lobe and one in the left upper lobe. And these lesions I would call subsolid lesions, and that means that there's both solid and ground glass components in both of these. And I said that there's no change in imaging at three months. What is the most likely diagnosis? So the correct answer here is malignancy, and this case happened to be a case of pulmonary lymphoma. But let's look at the other answer choices. So carcinoid is incorrect because this will present as a solid nodule, not a subsolid nodule. Infection is not right because although this could represent infection at a single time point, if there's been no change in imaging at three months, it's probably not infection because I should see either some improvement or progression of disease. And the same is true for organizing pneumonia as well. This is a chest x-ray of a patient with a pacemaker, and you can see that there's a normal right ventricular lead. I don't have a normal right atrial lead, but I do have a dislodged lead right here, right next to some coiled wires. And I could see that there are two terminal pins that are properly engaged in the connector block right there. Lead fracture can be tricky to see sometimes, so I would imagine that if you were to see this on a test, then they would make it very obvious or blow up that part of the image so that it's not that hard to see. So the correct answer here is B, dislodged right atrial lead. This is sometimes called twiddler syndrome, in which the patient plays around with their generator inside of the generator pocket in the subcutaneous tissues, and it causes the leads to dislodge. Now, I'm not quite sure why it's just the right atrial lead that got dislodged in this patient, but that's what happened. Case 49, which tube is malpositioned? So here I have an ET tube that looks like it's in good position. There's a left IJ line that looks like it's in good position in the SVC. There is an NG tube or OG tube, and that looks like it's in good position. But here, the right IJ line looks like it's going over to the left side. So this is the correct answer. Right central line is malpositioned, and in this case, it was placed in the carotid artery.
In this question, I have a chest x-ray of a patient with an ICD, but it looks like the ICD, instead of crossing over the mediastinum and going down the SVC on the right side of the mediastinum and then going into the RV, it's sticking to the left side of the mediastinum and then terminating kind of in the middle. So the question is, what vessel is the ICD lead in? So it's not the aorta, because if it were in the aorta, then it would continue on down inferiorly rather than stopping right here. Also, it looks like it's just lateral to the aortic descent rather than inside of the aorta. So this is incorrect. Left SVC is the correct answer here. Internal mammary vein is not correct because, again, it, it stops right here. And if it were in the internal mammary vein, it should continue going inferiorly. Anomalous pulmonary vein is also incorrect. If this somehow got into an anomalous pulmonary vein, I would expect it to go from the subclavian vein into the brachiocephalic and then maybe out into the lung. Um, this is very unusual for an ICD lead to go into an anomalous pulmonary vein. I've never seen a case of that. So the correct answer here is left SVC. A left SVC is an uncommon uh, anatomic variant, although it's not really rare. You'll see it from time to time. And these usually drain into the right atrium via the coronary sinus. And that was the last question. If anybody has any questions about any of the topics we covered, uh, feel free to leave a comment below.